Welcome to the Crazy Wisdom Podcast. My guest today is Beckett Dillon. He is an AI innovator and creator of the Anima Biomimicry and Nexus Internal Knowledge Map LLM Models and Datasets. So uh, we are going to have a great conversation, particularly about biomimicry and internal knowledge maps. Uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm just super excited. This will just be fun talking about all the crazy randomness of LLMs and AI. Yeah, right? Such a wild world. Okay, so I can't tell which one I want to go into first. I think it's going to be knowledge maps. Um, what is a knowledge map? Um, so my knowledge map to me is my I, I continuation or extrapolation of a knowledge graph. Um, I was trying to figure out how to imbue a knowledge graph into an LLM and train it into it. Um, but the way a knowledge graph fundamentally works and then the way like the AI training, like it just like, it doesn't quite work out, but I thought there was some way that you could at least get the same result or use the same framework. Um, it's really just an experiment. I got obsessed with knowledge graphs, trying to figure out how to incorporate that as best as possible into LLMs. Um, and I'm more into the training data sets area. So I was like, what can I do with it? And so it was an experimentation that worked out more than anything. It worked out. Yeah, 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 it totally worked out. How did it work out? Um, it seemed to actually get more nuanced and better responses. Um, after doing tons and tons of you know tests, so what I would do is I'd do it against the uh, the base model, the uh, the Mistral Instruct was my first one, um, and I would just do these these questions, and I love to do these random questions that are part logical but part creative. Um, so one of my favorite ones are um, the end of you know it's the, it's the apocalypse. Humans have used up every resource, and all we have left is cheese. So the problem is that the sun is dying. How can we use cheese to reignite oh. the sun? So it puts the, it puts the LLM in a really logical place of like, okay, these are our resources. The sun is dying, but all it has to work with is cheese. So it has to be creative. Um, I, I, I've come up with a list of these after a few years of testing them because it's like, I like to do the fun random ones. Um, but with that, so something like that is it'd be very easy for you to get your typical uh, response of just like, oh, you know, that doesn't really seem likely, but probably if you heated up cheese enough to a certain degrees, blah, blah, blah. Um, training it on this knowledge map, pretty much the idea is that what I'm doing is I'm flooding the LLMs during the training is I'm flooding it with metadata. So instead of just really boring prompt and response pairs is you get a prompt and response that then has just as literally as much as I could fit as metadata. So it's, what is this about? Um, what are other things that it's linked to? And I used it based off of, um, you know, the Obsidian note-taking app yep. mm -hmm. is I actually use that same framework because that works great of taking your notes and linking things and tagging things. So it's like, what if I just used the actual prompt and response pair and then structured it and, um, and built it out like one of those to where it has all of this linking metadata to itself explaining what is this question about? What was the internal thought process? What was the user intent behind it? What was the model intent behind the response? Oh. Does it link to anything else in it? And then within that data set is I made sure to make other things that it then linked to so it referenced itself. So the idea of creating the knowledge map was that you have a data set that then internally intuitively links to itself within the actual metadata and prompt response pairs, oh. rather than just a bunch of random, oh, what does this JavaScript do? Oh, what happens if you ignite cheese to a certain degrees? Is I would find a way to link that JavaScript and that cheese igniting through metadata somehow in that data set. Um, and so that's why there's so few responses or so few examples. I only have like 5,000 compared to other ones where I can generate like 30 or 50,000. It's because there's so much between like, okay, does this link to that? Does that link to that? Because um, you'll see a picture that I have on uh, the Hugging Face repo and that's the actual so, data set. Um, can you send me the link uh, in the chat? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, let me pull this up here. Because uh, I you, I dropped the data set into Obsidian, and then you can actually see what the model sees as as best as possible. That's great. And so uh, that was that was the experimentation idea. But yeah, I went on a couple tangents, so I don't know if I actually answered your yeah, question there. Well, I've got more, so no worries. Um, go for just shoot it. <laughs> just go for it. Uh, so there's a lot we can go from here. I mean, the first question is. Um, did you do this for someone else? If you aren't doing it for someone else, uh, are you going to try to make money with this? 
Um, I'm not doing it for anyone else. I'm doing it purely off of learning. I'm a learning by doing and a learning by failing. So I just, I just keep doing stuff until something works and until it, it finally clicks for me. Um, so that was my whole LLM process. I don't come from data science or machine learning. I'm an audio engineer, musician, um, who then came from a naturalist, um, natural habitat restoration background. So I like, I show things, I've done a bunch of different things. I love to just experiment and, and learn as much as possible. Okay, uh, this is um, actually a great, sorry, we're gonna go on a rim tangent, but my, my audience is used yeah. to that. Uh, um, I sent you a voice form beforehand. You're the first person who's actually filled it out. Um, knowing that my intention is to sort of, I would, I, I would have loved to have found out that you're into a natural habitat restoration. Uh, knowing that, how would you say that I could improve that process? Um, on that one, I guess it would have been seeing if you could get um, like a little bit of a snapshot Mm. of someone's journey and figuring out the right, right right way to frame it so that way you're getting the right data you're getting the right information out of them or else they can just go off on random tangents mm. but for me it would have been like my uh my professional journey has been it hasn't what been is your professional career. journey what is your professional journey Great. yeah it's been it's been a collection of learning a bunch of things i've been obsessed with um rather than being like i'm going to be a financial stock um, person, I've been like, oh, that sounds really cool and fun. I'm going to learn how to do that. And then I get obsessed with it and I go to take it as far as I can take it or until I get obsessed with something else. Um, so that was, um, you know, the conservation core is that's what I did when I was 19. That's what got me into natural habitat. So I was in Washington for two years, building trails in the middle of the woods, um, just living out there for months at a time. Um, so then I went from that and then I finally took that money because I got a little bit of uh, money and I went to school for uh, natural ecology and then like data science or not, uh, but computer science. And anyways, yeah. So like that would be the thing is like I've had this weird journey that ended up then finally at LLN and I feel like it's all, it's all come together at this final point. Yeah, it's all like right here. Which is interesting for AI in general because AI in general feels like it's wrapping together the entire history of personal computing in a way that I don't think many people are actually paying attention to, but me and my yeah. father are, are actually starting a podcast together. Uh, and he was kind of an important figure in the 1980s and the 1990s and the 2000s related to the early personal and continues to be today, uh, relating to the computer per personal computing industry and how it relates to AI. So we're going back and finding all the juicy anecdotes. Uh, we actually just That's recently interviewed uh, Steve Case, um, and I was just working today to, to Steve Case is the founder of AOL, and uh, and so uh, why did I bring that up? Because of AI, and AI feels like it's wrapping together just like it did for your personal career, uh, wrapping together the entire history of the personal computing industry and back bringing it back to its roots. And the roots, in my understanding of that era, was human augmentation. Um, how do we as individuals come together and compute together? And what does it mean to compute together? Well, it's definitely not what Facebook is doing. I have some, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're, I, I agree with you on that. I don't know what your feelings you are, it. but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does what that spark in you? Um, just like, I mean, so many different things because yeah. it's just become the epitome of so many focal points in culture of like, however, however you want to feel about something is you yeah. can find, you can find a way to leverage Facebook for your, your way to feel about it. For me, it's just, um, I was only briefly a part of the MySpace phase. Um, I've never been big about just uh, putting my life on social media or anything like that. So uh, the only things you can find on the internet are what I want you to find about me because I'm just, it's just, if your life is your life, um, but whatever. I think a lot of the problem is that it's just created these echo chambers and these vacuums. And I think we all have met people in our own lives who have, you know, found some version of that where you're like, if you just stepped outside of this for a day or two, um, I think you could alleviate a lot. But um, I think that caused a lot of problems. And I think it just, it, um, it doesn't bring together people as much as you would hope it would. Interesting. Yeah, it's the bringing together, it's funny because it brings people together online, but so that they can get mad at each other and lose all the values that they yeah. have in person, like to completely just like throw those away. Uh, exactly, in the exactly. Heat of the moment, like, getting angry at strangers on the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's not, it's just, it's not adding anything useful. Like we're already so close to a dead internet. Like the last thing we need are people being a part of that dead internet, which they so are. So. Oh, dead internet. 
Dead internet. That's a that's a, a term I haven't thought of before. What is the I've dead been thinking internet? about a lot lately, especially with the amount of bots um, Yes. and LLMs. Wow. Um, Ooh. and so now you're just seeing like it's just been the it's been upped the amount of just like it just things creating unnecessary content and then talking to itself about the content. And then trying to drag humans in. But now it's so good at trying to become a human that it tricks itself. And like you'll see these Reddit threads. If you're like, that's just, it's just, it's literally just GPT wrappers of different API, people doing different things to the API. And then it ends up on a Reddit thread talking to itself, selling it itself different things. And you're just like, this is what we're walking into. Um, Yeah, and it's and funny then because the, and that's like and then the AI generated yeah. comments, like. The like that's um, this one thing that's really getting me on LinkedIn is like people just doing that quick AI generated comment and you're seeing that you're like, oh, oh, you couldn't take like two seconds. Like, um, yeah, yeah, the AI content thing. And that's something I deal with in my job with supervised fine tuning is like you just deal with like trying to trying to not get AI content out back out there, but that's 10 other tangents I got to in your one question. Yeah, well, that, that's just good to know that they're thinking of that, um, because that's what I believe that that might be. We might have uncovered the real the risk here. Like, there's a few risks that people actually talk about that I think are really important, but they're very few. Like most of the risks that people are focused on feel like they're fantasies um, to me, uh, and or nightmarish fantasies. Um, and the, but the one that you just mentioned is a very very good point, which is what happens if the internet becomes 99% dead um, and, and from either bots or from bad actors uh, getting access to persuasive technology. Uh, what do you think on that? Um, I think there's a huge, I think that's a, a big, big problem that people um, are realizing, but not really realizing because it makes so much money for certain people, just marketing, copyright, just all of that. And especially now that you can have LLMs generating it and then you get clawed level interactions to where you're like, maybe a person did write that. Um, and so There's it's no starting way, and to there's get no to way that. for the robot, there's no way for the, sorry to interrupt, there's no way for the robot Yeah. to know whether something is AI generated, right? Though uh, all That the is, yeah, that's a huge thing is like, and that's, um, that's another thing I, it's daily that I've done tons of research and um, just from my own work is like, is, is, is it, can you tell if something is human generated or uh, is LLM generated? And you can, but the only way to do it is by gaining that like intuitive sense of by reading and, and, and studying it and, and seeing uh, examples of, you know, something that you would answer yourself, like a human answer versus uh, an LLM generated answer, because you pick up on a lot of G GPT isms. Like now we're starting to see a lot of the words that like there's in the research, you're seeing delve happen all of the time. And so you're seeing upticks in like multifaceted and tapestry. It's just these learn these words that for some reason, GPT and these LLMs just got into their pre-training data that they love to use. Um, and so beyond just those that it's just, it's, it's the way it delivers. And it's a lot of the times it's like uh, one of the key things is you'll get these send off statements at the end of every paragraph or they cut parts. It's like it, it gives you this nice little summary statement. Like it just doesn't talk like a human does. But there's that's hard to prove that it, human didn't write it because there are some people like academic writers and lawyers and people who write very dry and very matter of a fact. And they can write that because they write those operating manuals and those stuff that, you know, we read and like. Did a computer write it? But no, because it was before LLMs existed. So there's that thing of like, you have to give that leeway and gray area of that. There are those people. There's enough people in the world who can write mechanically. Yes. But when you see enough of this content just out there and, and having the layman all of a sudden start using this really formal speaking of English that we were all taught in school, but like, we don't, we don't use it and we don't really write like it. Like we try our best, but even in professional settings, unless you have to, to make that paycheck is we still try to be somewhat professional, casual and stuff. But um, yeah, you can't prove, I am on the side is you can't absolutely prove that anything was LLM generated by passing it through one of these detectors or anything like that. But if you spend enough time with uh, LLMs and talking to them and working with them, you'll, you'll be able to spot it. Yeah. It's brilliant. Um, I had one business idea that came to me and I've already written it down now and Good, we're good, good. Use it. <laughs> uh, uh, teaching teachers how to build intuition to see a whether something is Yes. AI generated content versus not, because That would be huge. can't, you can't prove it <laughs> just like, which my next point, 
which is you also can't prove consciousness in another human being. Um, with, and, and, <laughs> and you can't, you can't prove, uh, anything you can't prove any, no, I'm sorry. You can prove mathematical proofs. You cannot prove anything outside of mathematical proofs. I believe, um, uh, I'm not totally sure on that. If anybody listeners, or if you know, uh, please, um, uh, that sounds, that sounds right to me. I'm not hundred percent, but yeah. 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 So, but you can build evidence for things. And this would be about building evidence for things. I have, I've, I've been talking with a lot of teachers, uh, one who is a former guest on the show, Woody Wigman, uh, and he, um, uh, he is a, a teacher and he, he wants to uh, teach. He wants to continue teaching because teaching is a great career, but the business of teaching is starting to suffer greatly. Um, and, uh, and so we talk a lot about AI generated content uh, and how it's impossible to do that. And then I've got other teachers as well. And so I'm wondering if I could give them this idea to do that because that seems feels like a very good business to Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's it's figuring out how to do because it's like it's probably the same thing of um, so I come from your like a creative background, like music, because yeah. I made yeah. my money off of I don't know if you've ever heard of Song Finch before. No. Um, but so what it is is for you know a handful of years is this what I was doing? It's a website to where you go on and you want a custom song made for you or a loved one. It's a birthday, it's a wedding, Ooh. it's whatever. But you get like you know a legit you know commercial quality production song. Um, that's you know that's all about what you want, and you get to send them the details. You fill out a form, and you just get this thing. And so um, I was I was I was doing that because I was like a f- audio engineer. I had a full home studio. Um, I write, record, do all of my own music. Like that was just my life passion for the longest time. Um, I did the music thing in my early, early teens, twenties before I got burnt out and, and then went into conservation corps. So my first thing was actually touring and doing music before I got to the conservation corps, but that was like, I was like 15 to 18 at the time. So, um, so it all ended up with me coming back into like my mid twenties and early thirties, like, Oh, I'll do music again. And so I started hustling with these songs. Um, but the, the whole thing of when I first started getting to LLMs is there was a lot of pushback, me being a musician of like, dude, how can you get yep. into this? Yep. Like it's what it's, first of all, it's like, it's going to steal all of our stuff. Like it's not human, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, and a lot of this at the time was, was built around writing. Um, that was a lot of the talk and a lot of, of it was writing. And then it was a lot of when, uh, when people started to be able to train their own LORAs for stable diffusion and make their own stable diffusion models. And it started to get a lot better. Um, so then, but I was coming from the music background and the music wasn't quite there yet. It had, the generation was not nearly as good as like a month ago, I think is when it finally hit the point. Um, but in the conversation, I'd be like, well, first of all, AI has been a part of a lot of this for like a long time without you realizing, especially in the music in- industry of is machine learning. A lot of that is in the audio engineering of oh. auto-tune. A lot of these things of like, technically that's AI. It's machine learning. It's learning this. It's just not like you're not interacting with it the same. Um, so as a musician is like, especially on the production, music production side is you had to get very used to machines and computers doing some of the work, especially if you wanted to start making money doing it. Wait, um, yeah, go so for it. Do you know for this podcast, do you know a great thing that I can put the audio files? I go into Audacity. I know I could do it on Audacity. I once had the setting that I, it was a plugin for Audacity that I could plug in to get the good sound quality, but I've now lost that specific plugin and I can't find <laughs> it again. Uh, uh, maybe you know that plugin, maybe that's the solution, but um, do you know a good service that I can just pop pop the thing in and then it'll get the good sound? I've tried Descript. Descript does something, but it didn't actually, it's not very good. It, it like things, it does something. Do you know anything like that? Just cleaning up like like voice audio. So like conversations. Well, like actually this, let's, we like can talk about audio. this. So we could talk about this. So what what are the yeah. so I was talking to an audio engineer here locally um, in in Buenos Aires who's runs the podcasting studio that I'm now doing in person podcasts. And nice. by the way, I would like to invite you in, on again, either in person or remotely in six months because I'm really enjoying this Absolutely. conversation. Um, the the uh, so he was saying all the things that ab- about why it's been so challenging for me to record good quality audio and there are like technical reasons something about audio is really difficult um and so there's a whole bunch of variables and and what what are the key things in order to get good quality audio uh for a podcast voices not necessarily music but i'm sure that applies also yeah. to music, but podcasts are probably easier right yeah yeah because I mean, music is a whole different beast because you're doing a whole bunch of like separate things but um 
the voices are simpler with podcasts, but also more difficult because oh. voices are one of the hardest things to get on, oh. to get well. Because well, it's, it's more of the thing is there's so many different voices and there's so much going on and there's just like the range of inflections and stuff, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. It can actually be pretty simple. Um, to get really clean audio, really the two things, three things that come it comes down to is going to be uh, proximity. How close are you to the microphone? The closer, the better. Um, but you don't want obviously to a certain point. Uh, the environment is the less echo, the better, is you want it to be as bad as possible. And then um, the third thing is just really compression. And that's where the plugin comes into. And all that does is that just that just levels it out. That takes something that may be going up and down a bunch and just gives it more of an even keel. And that could be between both of our voices. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I, yeah. If I have Go an echo, if I have an echo, what is the service or what is the plugin that I could use there? And if I have, if I just know, because the compression, that's the thing that I'll do no matter what. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So on that uh, is you could do a, a gate. And honestly, a gate would be the easiest thing to get rid of an echo. Because uh, what that's going to do is that's just going to put a window to when it actually activates and deactivates your voice. So you can just go to where up above a certain de uh, decibel threshold. So above negative six decibel is when it activates. And so my voice comes in. But as soon as I stop talking, it then goes silent. So mm -hmm. what it does is you give a way for it to dynamically adjust with that and or sit in a certain window for what's actually happening in your conversation. So a lot of the plugins now, honestly, it's been like a been a year since I've done audio engineering because I've only been doing LLM stuff <laughs> since then. So I'm trying to I'm trying to pull from memory a little bit, but I've, I, yeah. I have enough to where uh, uh, what a lot of the stuff that I'm using, what it does is it gives you a window to work with. So you can right. set from negative six decibel to negative two dB is I want this to be my gate. So usually with our voices right now, we're both talking at a pretty even keel. So nothing's going crazy. So a lot of the time you can kind of set it and forget it. So what you'd be looking for is a gate. Um, with like a good like dynamic threshold. Um, and a lot of the times, I don't know what you what like what you use to actually edit, but um, man, I'd even be willing to like set you up with like a quick edit session to where you can just drop cool. your audio in. Yeah. And then um, and then all you have to do is do a couple of knobs because if you're looking for the same uh, standardized result each time, then you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, yeah, I got it. All okay. you need to do is like, that's the whole thing with template sessions is you just do it so that way you drop your audio in and you're like, oh, that, this guy was talking a little bit extra loud this time. So all you got to do is adjust that or you drop it in. You're like, oh, that that fits perfect with my last my last show. So um, it sounds like there might be another business idea here, which is um, doing the AI generated um, that that specific thing, those all those things that we just talked about um, and, and actually building that. Uh, um, but I'm I'm just going to schedule a call with you later to do this because that the, I don't want to bore my uh, audience with too many technical <laughs> no. details. Although they, although who knows? I I don't even know at this point like whether people who when they're not interested in whatever I'm talking about just like tune out or whether they. I, uh, it's probably why I have I don't have uh, millions of listeners. But um uh but uh so, okay. Uh, I think we got to go back to the LLMs because it's so interesting. The the um knowledge maps. This thing that you did, um, it seems really valuable. Why, why has like, why has nobody you've talked to, or why have you not like created a business out of it? Um, because I just jumped into the next experiment. Um, Which is what? Oh god, well, I don't remember what that one was. Um, I think at that point is I was really trying to then refine my uh, data set generation stack and stuff like that. Okay. Which is then what I'm kind of trying to then uh, build my business out of. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Out ahead. of that is I have figured out a way um, to completely generate a data set. I mean, thousands of examples, and it's uh, it's wiki based or Wikipedia based, so that way it's uh, in some source of ground truth. But it can also be uh, linked into your RAG. So if you have like com uh, wow. private company data or whatever you want to do, um, I have it so that way it pulls from both these sources and then depending upon what you're trying to generate, it's, it's essentially, it's a link wow. of a bunch of different prompt engineering and stuff like that. Um, I'd, be ha I'd be happy to show it. I'd be happy to share yeah, it with you so you can kind of see. I, would love um, to I, see don't, I don't have like a public link uh, not real yet. Um, but I'll send you, I'll send you a link behind the scenes. And, and this you is your business. So this is the business you're doing. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is, this is ideas. I'm trying to what I built out of it because what happened is like, I just started doing these models in my own experimentations. And then I started getting people reaching out to me of yeah. like, 
hey, how do I do this? Uh, because I do it completely without, I don't rely on GPT. I don't rely on Claude. Great. I don't rely, I do everything all locally, open source. all Hello. open source. Okay. So I use Olama or like LM studio. So I use Great. all, it's all GitHub based. It's all computer. Um, I have a Mac studio that, uh, so one of my fortunate things is because I had a home studio and I was making money doing music production, I had a legit computer. So with that legit computer, I was able to easily transition to like training my own LLMs and host thing. Like I can run a 7 billion uh, L Llama, Llama 3 model yeah. on my computer. Uh, I do command Wait. R plus all the time to generate data sets and it runs really smooth. Um, and so it's like, at this point, it's like, I just, I don't really need to use, like I do, I, you know, I do have the big accounts cause I, I'm obsessed with it. So I love to use everything, um, but you can do everything open source locally. Um, right. So I have finally figured out how to do that um, and do it to like a really good high quality level. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm building a course out of that. So if you don't want to hire me to do it, what you can do is just get, throw me a couple bucks. And then um, it's this entire course. I can send you the link to that. Yeah, please send quick. me the it's link not, right now in the yeah, chat. Not, that's not public, but you can check it out and see there and look through. And what that is, is pretty much that's my entire workflow. So it's just a tutorial of like, depending on where you're starting as a beginner or if you're starting from, uh, maybe you do data science, machine learning, but you wanna get into training your own LLMs. So you understand Python, you have, you don't know how to build your own environments, blah, blah, blah. Um, Great. So this is supposed to be just kind of jump in and get what you can, but this is the, this is the workflow I've developed over a couple of years of being self-taught and then uh, trying to do it as cheap as possible, open source, because I love open source. It, it's so fucking cool when yeah, they do. What we're going to talk about next, because I got a question that I'll, that I'll follow yeah. up with after that. But I want to understand how I can get you some money. What um, What is the, so the, the I'm on the GitHub page right now, uh, Vodalist Expert LLM Crafter, um, but it looks like this course is all open source as well. Uh so yeah, I'm, I'm figuring that out right now. I'm building it out. Um, I, I, I love GitHub. So right now I'm building it out on GitHub and doing all of that stuff. Um, and then um, I'm going to I'm going to do videos for everything. So I just got to do the videos. Last. Got it. And then once um, you're so done that with can... that, then then you'll create the course. Okay, great. Uh, so, but I might not even yeah. go through the course thing because I I'm a big believer in open source. So I'm not trying to yeah. put it behind like a, a Kajabi yeah. Yeah, and yeah. make someone go through that because like That's I believe in a bit of information. So probably what I'll end up doing is like I'll give away like if you want I'll give away like the data set generator like the like the actual stack like here, do it if you want to figure out go for it. But if you want to learn my workflow or something like here and you can purchase my course from through Stripe. I'm gonna make it as easy as possible and stuff because I'm not trying to like I'm not trying to paywall, but um, yeah. I just a lot of well, this is, nice have gotten this is the interesting it, so. thing I love talking about open source is that there's so many creative ways to make money while mm -hmm. being open source because we all need to make money we all need to pay for our lives uh, exactly yeah. So, yeah uh and so this leads to the next question do you think that llama is truly open source I can give more insight into that uh question if you need it uh, or if you want it um but uh do you think that llama from meta is an is a truly open source LLM um, I think as much as they can, much as with as big of the with the, as big as they are, with as many lawyers as they have. Yeah, interesting. Um, I think I think is I think um, and I'm not in any means like a meta fan. Yeah. I'm not like a Zuckerberg yeah. like Playboy yeah. or like I'm yeah. like I'm not a fan. Of, I'm not a fan of any of those people in a sense. Um, cool for what they do, but also not cool for what they yeah. do. It's yeah. a really yeah. devil-edged yeah. sword. Yeah. 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 Um, but on that front, I think at a sense. Um, especially in comparison with open AI, yeah. <laughs> which is very interesting. Um, there's not, they're, they're doing some great stuff. And obviously Microsoft is doing some awesome stuff with like their fly model. Um, but a really interesting thing that led me into uh, what might actually make Llama, Llama 3 I think is a little bit more lenient than Llama 2 if I remember, mm -hmm. but they're pretty, they're pretty much still like, don't use us uh, above a certain amount of users. And then also don't generate data sets with us. Uh, I think that's still a thing too. Oh. So I was trying to figure out those those links. And then those are the things I kind of pay attention to. I'm sure there's other creative things in wait, there. Wait, wait, can you go into them more? Because I, I, I don't understand um, uh, uh, the particulars there. So can you repeat that again as well? Um, yes, uh, it was kind of mainly uh, about the, the data set generation point. Was data that it? Data set generation, yeah. Yeah, so um, there's certain models that won't allow you to use them to then create synthetic data sets. Oh. 
Uh, um, essentially, you're leveraging their their whatever, their entire framework, their entire investment. It would be the same thing in their eyes as um, – so it's like the CNC uh, N by N40. It's like what Cohere has on their command plus or command R plus model yeah. to where it's like, we just want you to use this for research or you can use it above a certain amount. But if essentially, if you use their model to just generate, I mean, you could do, you could do it a 15. Because trillion. that's what they want to get into because that's what they want to do. Basically. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that thing of you got to really kind of pay attention and do that. And like, I don't know if anyone could really find out like really like where it came from other than in, if you didn't clean your data set and you started to see certain things of like what you'll see in a lot of um, unclean open source uh, ones generated by GPT-4 where it's like, I'm an open AI assistant or blah, 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 where it's like, those are your red flags of like, they use this. Um, and those are supposed to be a no-go, but I mean, no one really pulls a flag on that. So I don't, I don't know where the realm is. Um, I guess it's just a matter of like, I come also come from music production to where if you use a sample yeah, and then someone hears it and they're like, oh, I own that song now. So I mean, yeah, I'm pay me, like, pay me. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh man, it's so interesting. This is why I like talking to other free thinkers slash open source people because you've delved into the details because of your curios curiosity. You've essentially gone into all these parts that I, I'm, yeah. I've been trying to understand. Uh, particularly around this open source question, why did Llama do the specific open source? I forget what the Apache. They went against. They did not do Apache open source. Can you talk? Can you talk about Apache and like what it means? Because I'm not an expert. Yeah, on this. yeah, yeah. I, I'm not an expert either. Yeah. I only know the little bits. I just know that uh, Apache two or Apache three. One of the one of them is the one we want. I think it's Apache two. Okay. Um, but I'm trying, I'm trying to look up here. Yeah, and please, yeah, this is, I should start being explicit with guests that if- um, Oh yeah, no, no worries, no worries. I love, I love just freewheeling it uh, yeah. and not just necessarily being- um, Well, and then go and go, we're going to find it, which I imagine is what you're doing. Well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, just do the search thing. Um, yeah. But yeah, so pretty much what it is, it's just, um, it's putting, it's putting the barriers on what you can do with LLMs, which is really interesting in the fact of how much can you actually guard other than me, like deploying it using, a framework, which I think is what a lot of people are getting into is like they're using hugging face to then deploy the endpoint and blah, 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 or they're using um, certain libraries and stuff like that. So it's easier to track what you're doing with the model, where in me is I can download the, you know, the quant quantized llama CPP version of the model. And then I can train it and I can throw a couple adapters on it. And is it the same thing? Is it, is, I don't think, I don't know if it's the same Llama 3. So I don't know. It's like, I don't know where that breaks open, especially when you start doing stuff in your own kitchen. Um, but I know as far as like what we're looking for in the open source world is um, just to be as, yeah, just to be as open as possible yeah, is like yeah. the Llama doing the, uh, the Apache. But I think there's, a, I think they have what they have is they had the limit on the corporate. So it's like, if you end up getting a million users, like you got to start paying them money. Got so it. it's like, it's okay, some, it's, it. it's, it's, it's a certain, that's what they start to find. Um, and then I think it's, uh, they started adding creative things where it's like, you can't uh, generate uh, creative books or blah, 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 yeah, using the base model. You have to train it on something or whatever, like you have to start going through these steps and like, oh, honestly, okay. I haven't looked through. So this, it would be really interesting to go through and really learn um, what they're going after. But I think what it is, is it's them trying to just cover it's themselves on a lot of, yeah, on scale and toxicity and yeah. then being traced back. Because one thing I found interesting was, did you follow the Wizard LM release no. of, um, no. so Wizard LM was kind of like an offshoot of Microsoft mm -hmm. and they did trainings on models doing kind of their own logic. Um, a lot of them are code-based or math-based LLMs, but they started uh, doing like really cool stuff and they like started being kind of a, um, a mainstay in the community, but they were still a part of Microsoft and no one's hundred percent sure because they would just be released through a uh, hugging face and then oh, a GitHub repo. They got the knock on the door? No one, Did they get a knock on no the door? One, yeah, what happened was they released one model during the last Mistral, uh, Mistral drop at A22B, um, the bigger yeah. model. So they trained it, and but it was also Mixtral does uncensored. So they oh, didn't do a toxicity yeah. test. Oh. And it came back a day after they launched it. People are like, oh, hey, this one's pretty raunchy. <laughs> and then the, I'm guessing the, the Microsoft team was like, nope. They have pulled the models immediately. And then a week later, they completely shut everything down. 
So all of the wizard LM models got pulled. They had a whole family of them. Um, I need to check now. I need to make sure that I'm not just like, they aren't back up, but um, you can still find them because the, yeah, it looks like they're down for the most part because uh, the community is really great about mirroring models. Yeah. Um, so that way, if you just want to get your own, but yeah, yeah, they took it. Yeah, they took it down. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of people are guessing that it had something to do with uh, the toxicity and all of that stuff because of the legal teams. So it's like, that was technically open source, but they got shut down. So in answer to your, is Llama open source? I think they're doing the best they can. Yeah. And they're trying to put enough guardrails to where anyone can start doing what they want. Cause they released a base model too, which is like, go for it. You can train to do whatever you want at that point almost. We could get into a very long conversation here, uh, and and I want to be respectful of your time and as well as my, my oh, yeah, no, it's fine, uh, we're, we're uh, uh, So the there's a there's a there's a fine tuning question because I personally have I can't even remember why I want to fine tune something, uh, but yeah. there's been a desire to fine tune something recently, and I want to understand how difficult that is. But I want to put a pin in that particular conversation because there's also this question of legal teams and toxicity. And you have special knowledge on this about toxicity because you've been training. Um, uh, like, what do you consider to be toxic? There's the corporate model of what to what's toxic. And then there's the real, like what you as an individual believe is toxic. That's more what I'm interested in uh, because you have the special knowledge of what the corporate toxic means and stuff. Yeah, yeah. The corporate toxic really just comes down to use case. Yeah. Um, what do they, what do they yeah, deem yeah, yeah. as toxic because, yeah. Yeah. um, you know, sometimes, you know, it could be an only fans chat bot. Yeah. Got it. So yeah. that version of toxic, yeah. 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 Well, cause that version of toxic is talking about making nuclear bombs. It's not talking oh. about sexual acts. So what you're then is you're defining toxicity within a framework. Cause what if, you know, what if I work for only fans and I'm hiring a company to then make a chat bot for my users to interact with. So what you're doing, so like the, the, the client corporate level of toxicity really is deemed upon their use case. Um, yes, got it. Because got it. like there could be, so say like, I mean, there could be something to where it's like a medical document or a legal document. And technically the things that are covered are pretty brutal, mm. which might, an LLM might be like deemed toxic, but the framework and the, the, the context with which it's uh, actually working in, um, it makes a lot more sense for you know what's being displayed stuff. Me personally, I believe in freedom of information. I believe in um, being allowed to do what you want as long as it doesn't harm other people. And so I know that still leaves gray area. So that's not a lot of like, well, what if I train a model to harass somebody and then it just calls people nonstop yeah. and harasses them? Like, okay, that sucks. Like we don't, we don't want yeah. that. that. That is not something we don't want those types of things. But we also can't control those bad actors and we can't start putting those things in place to overly control those bad actors because they're going to pop up no matter what. We still deal with spam. We still deal with viruses. We've had the internet for so long and that's a forever thing. So it's a thing of how do we mitigate it? How do we, instead of trying to do the, you know, the celibate or abstinent thing of like, yeah. <laughs> you know, everything must be neutered. Yeah. Nothing can be, you know, uncensored in any way whatsoever. It's a thing of, okay, let's build the right, um, transparency and the right um, understanding of what you're getting into. Um, yeah, because that's a hard thing. Is like, yeah, I, I don't use LLMs. I don't train anything necessarily uncensoredness into LLMs just because like that's not what I experiment to, but I have nothing against it. Yeah. Like I actually got really interested to the thing recently where they do the, um, uh, what's it called? It's the, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to massacre the name, but your D um, algorithm, you're not doing, what is it called? Essentially what you're doing is you are changing the aspects in an LLM for refusals. They just recently kind of figured out how to um, pinpoint directly within the LLM vector space, Whoa. Um, how to, like how to pinpoint where it decides to make refusals. So what it did, oh. if someone did it with the Llama 3 recently, so what it does is every time it starts to come upon the point in its brain to where it has the refusal point, it then, instead of going what it was trained on pre-trained of being like, oh, I can't do that. They found a way to go in there and with like a scalpel is switch that from a zero to a one. So oh. then it is like, oh, I can do that. And so you don't have to like do a full retraining. It's just going in and doing like a little flip and all of these little spots of refusal. Um, 
So there's that way. And essentially what you're like, you're de-lobotomizing. You're then making one that uh, an LLM without changing any of pre-training or having to fine tune it is you're just changing its ability to react. Um, so I think, I think everyone needs the ability to shape an AI to do whatever they need to do. Because I think the future is everyone having their own personal LLM assistant that is 100% theirs. No one else has access to. It's just, it's, it's them. It's the same way we treat our laptops and stuff. It's, you don't expect people to, you know, come in and look at your hard drive and always have access. That, that's your, that's your AI, your desktop. So I think in the future we'll have that. So what we need is we need the freedom to continually have the models be able to adapt to anybody and all of their needs, because we also don't know future use cases and stuff. Yeah. Um, I think just training a better culture around it is going to be better than trying to just neuter the entire thing. Um, Cause you can't control it. It's like the internet in the early in, in, you know, when it first happened, it's like, we don't know what it's going to be exactly. We've got a lot of great ideas, but trying to put a harness on it, it's not going to help. Um, yeah. How can, how can you even do it? How can you even put a harness on? Exactly. The... It's such wasted effort. <laughs> and they're going to try it. I know Europe is going to try it. U.S. Yeah. might also try it. And the, the difference between the way U.S. and Europe might try it is really interesting because the, the way that Europe is going to try it might also be the same reason, uh, which is regulatory capture. But the way that I imagine that the U.S. is going to do it is regulatory capture. And here we're going to go into territory of, of the what you mentioned about open AI being open. Uh, they are not necessarily open. They're not actually at all open. You, you mentioned all. Llama. Llama is is a is a it's a llama is a uh from meta who i ideologically disagree strongly with uh in their 100%. sense of privacy uh uh but they've they're the most open source of all the giants uh and open ai is meanwhile hinting that they have agi because that hint is good marketing uh, uh yeah. they might yeah. have agi in which case life is going to change drastically in the next few years but yeah uh, um uh but so there's there's that and they're knocking on the doors lobbying behind the scenes saying hey guys you don't understand what ai is we do we under we have agi oh okay give us the power formulate this into law they might only according, according to me now re doing the same thing in europe um, where they're probably getting much more uh, mm. uh, 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 headway. Uh, in this, I'll just sneak this into the conversation as well. Um, uh, uh, I'm down here in Argentina. Argentina has some very interesting experiments going on, uh, particularly oh, related great. to uh, sociopolitical things, some of which I agree with, some of which I don't agree with. Um, and But one of the things that I think hopefully is going to be uh, uh, strong here is a freedom from regulatory capture. There's a few hints uh, recently that make me think that that's not the case and that there is no political situation to the to the troubles to our troubles. Uh, uh, but um, I, I'm hoping that's the case. And if it is the case, I want to be very supportive of that and create or help create some sort of um, amnesty or free zone in terms of AI experimentation. Uh, not to mean yes. that there shouldn't be regulation. I think that there might actually be a good case for regulation, but with the understanding that the way the regulation in the United States and Europe is gonna go in China uh, uh, is, is, is not, uh, a, a not something that we as a species want. Um, and hopefully no. if, if I could be as humble to dis discuss or not lack of humble to discuss what we as a species want. Uh, but globally, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, uh, what do you think of that? Yeah, um, I, I very much, I'm on your same side of um, championing the, you know, the open source and the freedom, you know, to use a lot of this, but also to understand it and to have it just evolve naturally and not um, through, you know, the white knuckles of a whole bunch of people who are trying to profit from it. Um, because I do believe, yeah, regulatory, I think things do need to get regulated. Um, you know, coming from an environmental background is a lot of my um, stuff back then as I was doing biodynamic work. And so it was trying to replenish what we had done due to not regulating. Um, 
And so I think unfortunately is like, because of where the money funnels and all of this, you know, fun financial stuff is they're going, the, the people with the power are focusing on regulating the wrong thing. So we actually need to regulate people like OpenAI, people from making monopolies, from actually doing things like what I saw recently is they're going to start trying to train advertisements into their LLMs. So it's actually like, it's, it's trying to regulate an invasion of privacy and it's an invasion of autonomy and all of these things. Um, so like, that's where I think like we do need to regulate, but we need to regulate these beasts who are then trying to leverage LLMs um, for more of their own profiteering, which like they're going to do. I understand we we live in the corporate world. That is the thing, but we don't have to always do it, you know, trying to suck blood out of the stone type deal. That's what it is. Um, it, is it is a vampire. It is, it is a vampiric yes. uh, 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 a thing. And, and this is really important because the myth of the vampire, I don't believe that vampires actually exist in human form um, or in uh, the, I'm not going to go down that tangent. Okay, so uh, uh, that'd be another fun conversation. I'm yeah, yeah. Uh, So it's vampiric. It's it's it's. Yes. Um, I've I've been using the word soul soul extraction because that's yes. what I believe Facebook is doing, and I don't believe it. It's because Mark Zuckerberg is is evil or anything like that. I don't think that Mark Zuckerberg is evil. I believe that he is autistic. Aspergers did not fully. Um, understand the forces that he was he was working with, and and essentially made some choices that that are against humanity's interests, uh, uh, and are essentially like le led us down a path, which I think is the main problem with Silicon Valley, is that they all wanted to change the world, uh, but they didn't really look at how they were changing the world. Understandable, it's like when you change the world, it's like you don't know where how that's going to play out. Um, and so it's vampiric and, and open AI is going to make the same choices. And it's funny because in their birth story, in that myth, the, the, that they created uh, with Elon Musk and, and, and Sam Altman, the reason was for the reason that, that, that is happening. It's just like, they, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So they your... became the two face of like, they just got to, they yeah. became the villain. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's just, that's the thing. Um, and so I think that's why we need to, you know, we need to protect some of this. Like I have honestly started putting together, um, this might sound a little crazy, but I honestly, I love it too, of like kind of like a doomsday thing of like, you know, here's all of the code. Here's all of the bare PyTorch code for building models because it's just math. So it's like, if something were to ever happen or they wanted, it's like, there's no reason why we couldn't recreate this if we needed to. Yes. Um, Very important. I think so, about this all the time. Okay. Yeah. So it's just that idea of like, if they ever, if they ever wanted to pull the plug on hugging face and there goes all of my models, cause I can't host all of the, you know, that terabyte of information and stuff like that. So, you know, we're leveraging some of their frameworks and stuff. Um, but what I can do is I can save the important pieces to then rebuild myself um, in case I ever need to, uh, cause it's math. It's math and computers. And I think I think we're at the point now in our civilization to where people can't control math and computers. Um, people, people, people can build computers in their basements and stuff like that. So it's like, I think no matter what, we can figure something out. So I think it's-, it's, it's Are uh, you scared? Are you- Not are you, really. Are, are you, I but think are, I'm no, more- I, 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 I didn't ask the right, the right question. Are you scared personally? Some of the stuff you're doing is quite spicy. I sometimes get scared of, of speaking the way that we're speaking. Um, because it's so open and, and, but that's what the part of love about the freedom of information is that like other people have done it and we, we know about all these other people. Yeah. Uh, so are you scared personally ever of, 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 of talking so openly about uh, these problems or no, I'm sorry about n having specific special knowledge of the way that certain forces in the world uh, can, and speaking about those, so for example, like about open AI, are you scared about yeah. talking about open AI like that? Um, no, no, not, not necessarily um, because it's all just, you know, it's my opinion. I don't work for them. I don't know yeah. anything about what happens internally other than what they release. So all I can get is conjecture and stuff like that. But, um, but even just based on that and how they um, interact with, because essentially, as I look at the open source community as, you know, the sibling to the closed source mm -hmm. and enterprise, because they work like enterprise loves to be like, oh, if you if it wasn't for us, 
blah, blah, blah. But it's like, oh, if it actually wasn't for open source, because how many of these enterprises, you know, use Langchain, use Llama Index, yes. yeah, yeah. use all of these repositories that are built from just people who love doing it or these smaller companies who, you know, build these frameworks and these libraries and stuff like that, um, where you then get, you know, open source or you, know, you get the enterprise being like, oh, well, well, let's just add that too, because we didn't think of that. So it's this, it's this symbiosis. And so I think there needs to be that relationship of close source having the money to train these crazy giant models that you know yeah, we can't yeah, afford to do. Um, so there's that. It's like having that, because we would never be able to as a community get together at this point and train a llama three. Unless it was crowdfunded. Tokens is insane. Unless yeah. it was crowdfunded. Um, is anybody doing crowdfunded open source training? No, I, I I I want to so bad. Like I it's like I have so many great plans for like what we can do because it's getting to the point to where we could start building our own our own versions of this. I think as a community, it's just figuring out how to build that framework um and get the right people involved. But like I think we could have our own Llama 3. Um, even just like the, the, there's such brilliant minds in that local llama subreddit of people who are in there doing like the hard work of like figuring out in production what's working, what happens when a thousand users hit this one model at one moment and there's five agents interacting. Like, oh my God, I, you know, I've seen people get bills of like, here's my, you know, my bill of thirty thousand dollars while I was experimenting. <laughs> Oops. Like, um, but it's like these little things that like, you know, getting these people together and getting us behind one, you know, one version of a truly open AI. And I hate to even use that in the, in the <laughs> that framework, that sense. Um, but there's a lot. And I think Hugging Face is doing really awesome with what they're doing and what they're pushing and what they're making available. So I think that's as close as we can get. Um, but of course, it's just like, it's just, it's the Wild West. So there's so much going on. There's so much that's just it's hard to coalesce in that sense. Um, but also, no, I, I don't feel any fear of talking about any of it as well because it, it, because it is the Wild West. Um, and I'm out there doing it as well. So if they're asking like, what, you know, where's my opinion coming from? And stuff like, well, I'm training these models. I'm seeing this happen. I'm interacting with your enterprise models. And this is what I'm seeing as well. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what they do. I don't mean enough for them to scare anybody yet. So maybe down the line, but at this moment, no. Interesting. You, you don't think the uh, Boeing, Boeing, like Boeing, I don't know if you saw the Boeing thing, the Boeing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, has, that's yeah, sad. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, I don't mean to laugh, but but it is uh, uh, quite intense, you know, and that's not, that's well, not the thing. And, and new it's thing, the money. Yeah. It's like, if you can yeah. start messing with their money or their supply chain, um, yeah. I don't think, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I don't think at this point, there's a lot of us in the open source world who could truly like neuter a company, like, you know, one of the big enterprise yeah. ones. Yeah. Um, really what we can do is we can keep like working on making the models better and making it easier for normal people to interact who might not even know anything about LLMs now. And they learn about GPT-3 and then they learn about GPT-4 and then they learn how, oh, it trains on all my information. But then the bridging the gap to getting into open source is, is a lot easier than it was even like six months ago, but still not quite there. So I think is making it just love, leveraging the playing field as much as possible. Um, and so that's my hope as well, is like if I can use any of the knowledge that I've gained of like, like anyone can do it. Like literally, if you just, just time, if you just take the time and just want to learn a couple of things, you don't even have to learn everything perfectly. Just learn enough to make sure that you're not ruining or destroying your own computer. Um, but yeah, I think just freedom of information and LLMs are one of the best tools for freedom of information because they're repositories for it. They're mm -hmm. compressions of human knowledge um, and the ability to learn. Like I did not know anything about Python two years ago. And now I'm building Python stacks and building PyTorch models and, you know, reading through this and like understanding the research papers behind, you know, the Jamba model. Like that was my latest obsession was the Jamba of a brand new architecture uh, being released. And that's all through me, you know, just talking and learning through LLMs and reading through docs and copy and pasting and being like, what does, what does this mean? Um, and then failing over and over. And then finally they got the co-pilot. Um, where you can start getting it to read your code. And that was like helpful. But before that, it was like, that was me. Like, and I remember like the old token, like context windows that you'd only get like 512 or maybe uh, 1024. So you'd be doing these little chunks at a time. Um, 
yeah, I already feel like an old man in the LLM days of where it started to where it is now, where you can just pretty much put entire textbooks in there and be like, oh, what was that? What was that, you know, question? So this is so interesting because we didn't even get to the point that I wanted to get, which I had forgotten that when we started, which was learning how you learn using AI, because I can tell that you're also probably one of the the few people have caught on to what I've caught on, which is well, maybe not a few, there's probably millions, but uh, um, uh, the, the how well AI can teach us uh, in yeah. things we're not already experts in. Um, if we're experts, AI can't really teach us, but if we're anything less than the average of the of human species, yeah. the average of experts, uh, then that can teach it. But we are running out of time, and but uh, we will do more podcast episodes, I believe. Well, absolutely, yeah. Calendar. And uh, so I'd be happy to do as many as possible. Where do you speak publicly, and where can they find it? Um, really, you can find me through um, just like my LinkedIn hugging face posts, stuff like that. Um, I'm trying to start being more active. Um, maybe a YouTube channel, maybe things like that. But I get such tunnel vision in the actual work and experimentation um, that what happens is every now and then I'll just pop up and like, here's a whole family of models and a brand new data set and a completely new approach to, you know, trying to figure out this problem. But I'm trying to be more, I think I've hit the point to where like I've got that under wraps. So now I'm trying to be more interactive with the community and actually like um, sharing what I've learned and helping people bridge that gap themselves. Um, so yeah, you know, come find me, reach out, you know, find me on LinkedIn, find me on Hugging Face. Um, I try to use the same name for everything. Severian is my tag name, but Beckett Dillon, pretty easy to find anywhere. Um, I got my website, BeckettDillon.com. Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to get people to, you know, use LLMs to learn, but then also use LLMs to, um, just leverage their life for, you know, better productivity and just better everything. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This was awesome.